Hello. This is a long lecture dealing with a number of 18th and 19th century thinkers who tried to understand what we would describe as psychological processes through physical observation and measurement. There's an obvious contrast between the work of these men and the philosophers whom we've been discussing in the first three lectures of this course. The philosophers had raised many important psychological questions, but for the most part, sought answers through self-examination, reflection, and rational debate. They often took a keen interest in the scientific advances of their day, but they were not scientists. Whilst astronomy, physics, anatomy, and physiology began to emerge as modern sciences, psychology, such as it was, remained firmly part of philosophy. The approach of those whom Morton Hunt labels physicalists was essentially practical and empirical. Of note, most of them were trained as medical doctors and several were involved in physiological research. They were still concerned with philosophical questions, sometimes very explicitly, but they were essentially men of science seeking hard evidence to answer these questions. Philosophical psychology continued during this period, but became increasingly peripheral to inquiries which gradually laid the basis for the emergence of modern psychology, and the conception of psychology as a science held by most of its practitioners. The material covered in this lecture is distributed over five videos. First, the ideas of the two savants, Franz Mesmer and Franz Gall, then a short summary of some of the main developments in neuroanatomy and neurophysiology in the 150-year period from the 1730s through to the 1870s, uh, then the development of the new physiology of Johannes Müller and Ernst Weber, the psychophysics of Gustav Fechner, and finally the findings of Hermann van Helmholtz and Franciscus Donders. As with other lectures in this course, the recommended textbook is Morton Hunt's The Story of Psychology, but these lecture summaries are structured somewhat differently from his book. First, let's talk briefly about Dr. Franz Anton Mesmer, uh, a boy from a relatively humble background in Swabia, in what is now the southwest of Germany. Mesmer found success in Vienna, where he qualified as a physician and married a rich widow who gave him entry into Viennese high society. Practicing as a doctor, he experimented with using magnetism as a cure for ill health. When Mesmer had been a student, he'd been attracted by the idea that there were connections between the force of gravitation and the condition of the human body and mind by way of an invisible bodily fluid. Now in Vienna, he tried treating patients by touching them with magnets, reasoning that the bodily fluid was magnetic in nature and that health could therefore be restored to the sick by realigning and harmonizing the fluid. This was his theory of animal magnetism. Beginning with his first patient in 1773, a young woman who may well have been suffering from some form of hysterical neurosis, he claimed remarkable success in treating those whom other doctors had been unable to help. And he soon became famous, giving well-attended lectures and demonstrations which revealed his skills as a showman. The Viennese medical elite was suspicious of his fame, however, and in 1777 Mesmer's claim to have partly restored the sight of a blind girl was shown to be unfounded, and he was denounced as a charlatan. He thereupon fled Vienna, leaving everything behind, including his aging wife. Moving to Paris, however, he quickly gained new fame, gaining a mass of wealthy patients and changing his healing techniques so that he could treat groups of patients at a time. He also found that he could affect his patients by his own touch, gesture, or his long, intense looks, a skill he thought might be due to the unusually great magnetism of his own body. His popularity was even greater than it had been in Vienna. He also attracted many would-be disciples who studied under him and wrote pamphlets and books about his treatment. As in Vienna, the medical establishment in Paris regarded him with disdain. And in response, the now well-connected Mesmer petitioned the king to appoint a commission of inquiry to examine his claims. This group, 
which included Antoine Lavoisier, the chemist, and Benjamin Franklin, the American ambassador, met in 1784 and devised the remarkably modern experiment in which patients were falsely told that they were going to be magnetized through a closed door. When the patients responded to this trick as if they had been affected by magnetization, the commission concluded that the effects of Mesmer's cures were through the imagination of those they wanted to be cured, rather than any quality of the cure itself. Disgraced again, Mesmer left Paris, spending most of the rest of his life in Switzerland. Was he a fraud? Possibly. He certainly was a very effective showman, but he also seems to have sincerely believed in the efficacy of his own cures, and so did most of his patients. Clearly something happened as a result of his treatments, and even if it was only due to the patient's imaginations, they did have a sense of being cured. Although mesmerism had been discredited, it continued to attract attention, a number of practitioners employing it as a healing art or as a sideshow entertainment. Abandoning the use of magnets as unnecessary, these practitioners claimed to produce cures through rituals, incantations, and eye contact. And like mesmer, they succeeded in giving some patients relief from some symptoms. By the 1840s, however, a small number of doctors in France, Britain, and the United States were willing to experiment with what the Scots physician James Braid renamed neurohypnology, or what we nowadays call hypnosis. Rejecting all the quasi-magical ideas associated with mesmerism, they saw it as an essentially psychological process which depended for its success on the susceptibility of the patients. Clearly, some patient symptoms could be relieved through hypnotism, and of particular importance in an age without effective anesthesia, the method could relieve pain during medical procedures. In purely pragmatic terms, it had beneficial results, and as such was worth trying. There were arguments about the nature and process of hypnotism, and about which patients could be hypnotized, but the method was increasingly accepted by the medical establishment as a valid form of treatment, with a number of distinguished physicians using it successfully by the 1880s. This new respectability was acknowledged in 1882 when the French Academy of Sciences accepted that hypnotism was a neurological phenomenon and the lingering links with the pseudoscience of mesmerism were finally cut. We turn now to Franz Joseph Gall. Gall came from a wealthy Catholic family in Baden, but completed his medical training in Vienna. His contribution to the story of psychology uh, was threefold. Firstly, and directly, as a brain anatomist. Secondly, uh, through his emphasis on the cortex as the seat of intelligence, he helped move psychology significantly away from metaphysics towards being an empirical science. And finally, indirectly, uh, he founded what became known as phrenology, and by so doing provoked an ongoing experimental study of the localization of brain functions uh, as a means of testing his theories. Carl's work on brain anatomy was of major importance in discovering its structure, and was facilitated by the new system of brain dissection which he devised. His findings included that the two halves of the brain are connected by stalks of white matter, that the fibers of the spinal cord cross over when connecting to the lower brain, so that sensations from one side of the body reach the brain on the opposite side, and that the larger the amount of cortex, the gray matter on the surface of the brain, possessed by a species, the greater its intelligence. Although these findings are now part of standard neurological knowledge, they were highly controversial at the time and the ecclesiastical authorities and the Habsburg Emperor were apparently angered by the idea that the higher mental powers of humans could be attributed to brain size rather than to the possession of a soul. Allegedly for this reason, in 1801 the Emperor forbade Gaul to give further lectures, as they were held to lead to materialism, immorality, and atheism. After repeated attempts to get the Emperor to reverse this decision, Gaal embarked on a successful lecture tour of the German states before settling in Paris in 1807, where he remained for the rest of his life. 
Gal's major work as an anatomist is now largely forgotten, and people remember him instead as the originator of the pseudoscience of cranioscopy, later renamed phrenology. Having realized that human intellectual superiority to animals was linked to the greater development of the human cortex, Gall wondered whether differences between individuals in intelligence and personality might also be linked to measurable differences in individual cortical development. But how to explore this idea? He could look at casts of the brains of the dead, but he couldn't open up people's skulls, and there was then no way of scanning the living brain. Accepting the idea that there were distinctive mental faculties, Gall theorized that the development of a particular faculty would lead to the associated part of the brain being larger, and that this increase in size would be indicated indirectly by an expansion of the part of the skull covering that particular part of the brain. With this idea, he then set about identifying a series of presumed skull areas corresponding to the various separate organs of the brain uh, for affection, courage, vanity, homicidal tendencies, religiosity and so on. Together with a young colleague, uh, Gal painstakingly examined the skulls of hundreds of patients, friends, prisoners, asylum inmates and others to map out their skulls, initially identifying 27 regions of the skull which were supposedly linked to particular mental faculties. Their research method would now be seen as fundamentally flawed in that they looked for individuals who had extreme qualities, for example they were criminals or insane, and then looked for similarities in their skulls. There was no control group and there was no random sample. Starting these studies in the 1790s, lecturing and accumulating a large collection of skulls, Gall soon found himself to be a local and later international celebrity. There was growing and serious interest in his idea that personal traits could be identified in a way that seemed scientific. Popularized by others, his ideas formed the basis for an international movement which seemed to offer an easy way of studying individuals' characteristics in a way that was reminiscent of the ancient idea of physiognomy, the interpretation of character and mental abilities from the shape and size of facial features, another pseudoscience which was widely accepted at the time. Ultimately discredited by orthodox science, phrenology nevertheless provoked an important new area of scientific research, the localization of brain function, a subject which we will examine in the next video.